Hi, my name is Dr. Mike Evans, and today I'm wondering if more is better. Specifically, if more screening tests are better. I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's just a test, so it doesn't seem like there'd be a big downside. And it might pick up something early. So to explore this question, let's paint a picture. Say you've been going to a family doc or a GP for many years. And when they see you for an annual checkup, they do a whole bunch of tests. I should point out now that we're talking about screening, the kind of tests we do when you're symptom-free. So if you did have symptoms, say a sudden onset of severe fatigue, or it hurts when you pee, or you have a strange lump, that is a different story, and we'd be much more likely to order tests to find out what's going on. I'm also making the assumption you are average or, or low risk. So for example, if you've been on a chronic medication likely to cause osteoporosis, or if you have a strong family history of a disease, we might take a different course of action. I will link you to some online risk assessment tools below and at the end so that you can see where your own risk is at. So let's say your doc always tested your thyroid and, and your vitamin D levels, a chest x-ray, an ECG tracing for your heart, tested you for osteoporosis. Maybe you're a woman under 21 and you've had a pap test or, or, or in your 40s and had a mammography ordered. Okay, now imagine you've moved and, and switched to a new doctor and she or he doesn't order any of these screening tests. In fact, she doesn't even want you to come in for an annual, opting instead to invite you for a prevention visit every few years. So you might wonder, hmm, was my last doctor better? More thorough? Great question. So let's look at these tests one at a time. Let's start with the one that is most debated, whether low-risk women should have screening mammography to detect breast cancer in their 40s. This is a hot potato right now and the subject of much debate. Some think that the number of lives saved are so small that all the cost and effort and the high rate of false alarms, investigations, unnecessary biopsies, etc. are not worth it for individuals and we should be investing in something with a better return as a collective. Others feel that it's the best option we have, that it's getting better, and that treating early could give better treatment options. They just feel better knowing where they are at even though they know mammograms aren't perfect. For me, this last point is key, knowing that the tests aren't perfect. We want them to be black and white. This tells me whether I have or, or don't have the disease. But as you will learn as we walk through these tests, in fact, they're all about trade-offs. While screening tests can find illness, it can also misdiagnose people as diseased when they are not, or tells people they are fine when they are not. There's more precision for high-risk people and less precision for low-risk people. We see this ripple effect with mammograms, possible earlier diagnosis and treatment, which is what most of us picture, I think. But it's also important to consider how you would manage the much higher probability of a false alarm and possibly triggering invasive procedures to show, in the end, it was nothing to be concerned about. Understanding these possible repercussions pre-test is key. I should point out again here that if you do have a lump or you are at higher risk, don't let this debate delay you from having discussion with your healthcare provider. What family docs will tell you is that we focus on the testing, but it's, it's actually about the relationships. I know that sounds funny, but if you have a good relationship with your doc, this leads to screening that's more personalized, that takes into account your values, the science, and your own unique risk. The prevention is partly about the right screening, but the bigger game in town is you having healthy behaviors and, and partnering with you to make positive change in your life. Okay, let's look at some of the other tests in our basket. For some tests, we simply don't have the trials showing they are effective. These tests might be ordered out of habit, maybe because they can be helpful in high-risk people. So, so I would say thyroid and ECG testing fit here. A 2015 review in the Annals of Internal Medicine showed not one single study that directly assessed benefits and harms of screening for thyroid dysfunction in low-risk people. The United States Preventive Task Force, or the USPTF, looked at what research data was available and concluded that routine screening is not recommended unless there are symptoms and signs of thyroid disease or you're pregnant. Does a screening electrocardiogram or, or ECG of your heart make a difference? The resting ECG is problematic as it sends a mixed message. Approximately one-third to one-half of individuals with a healthy heart have ECG abnormalities. Approximately 30% of individuals with proven heart disease have a normal resting ECG, and most coronary events occur in individuals without resting ECG abnormalities. The USPTF reviewed the science in 2012 and recommended against screening ECGs if you're at low risk for heart disease. 
Next is measuring vitamin D levels in the blood, which is interesting, especially to us in the northern latitudes of Canada. And again, I'm talking about the average person, not somebody who has malabsorption, kidney disease, or other risk factors. I suppose there are three pieces to the vitamin D puzzle. Question number one is whether vitamin D supplementation helps. So that's probably its own whiteboard, but, but I would say that it's the one vitamin left standing with smaller trials showing benefit for bone, heart health, cancer, and so on. On the other hand, we thought this about many other vitamins, and then larger high-quality randomized control trials showed they actually didn't help. We are still waiting for these larger trials in vitamin D. Second is the test itself, called 25-hydroxyvitamin D. There's some debate about the test and considerable variation between labs. The ideal level of vitamin D in a person's body has not been rigorously established for the population in general or for specific ethnic groups. Finally, there's the flip side approach, and that is, instead of focus on testing, we focus on lifestyle change like eating well and, and getting outside. And if we are at risk, say in the winter or if we are dark skinned or institutionalized, instead of testing, we simply take a vitamin D supplement. Now let's look at osteoporosis. Again, we are missing high quality research trials to tell us exactly whom to screen. But we also know that osteoporosis related bone fractures are common as we age. Women are at higher risk, and, and these fractures can cause loss of independence, function, and premature death. So expert groups mostly feel that the two groups that will benefit from screening with bone densitometry are 1. Women and men over 65, and 2. People with one or more risk factors such as having a low-impact fracture, low weight, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. See the risk assessment tool for a longer list. Your bone density score dictates how soon you will have to do follow-up testing, but the key message is that once we have a snapshot, we get a better sense of your bones if we leave some time in between testing. So for example, if you're at low risk, you can actually wait five to 10 years. Sooner if you have risk factors, but most people can wait two years. On to our next test. Should you get a chest x-ray? Well, for people that have smoked a pack a day for 30 years or more, we have emerging evidence in favor of a low dose chest CT scan. But as far as a chest x-ray, a large randomized trial of about 150,000 men and women aged 55 to 74 showed that a single view screening chest x-ray done every year did not make a difference in the number of people dying from lung cancer. So finally, let's look at pap smears, where we take a swab from a woman's cervix to check for cancer. Our story here has changed. We used to say we need to do a pap annually on all sexually active women. Now, the science tells us that we're getting many false alarms without benefits for younger women. The smarter strategy is to have a pap test at age 21 if you're sexually active. And if it's normal, then repeat every three years. We stop at age 70, but only if there are no problems in the previous 10 years, which means three normal pap tests. Okay, hopefully you can see with these various tests that some are complicated, some have no evidence, and some need to be done, but only for people at higher risk or at longer time intervals. Speaking of time intervals, even the concept of an annual physical is not based in science. It's not usual practice outside of North America. It's easier for us to remember every year, but that doesn't mean it's best for our health. For example, high-risk people get screened more often, but optimal interval screening for common lab tests like cholesterol is every three to five years, or every three years for diabetes. I actually have mixed feelings about this. I love the opportunity to just focus on prevention with my patients, but like most family docs, I've shifted from blind annual testing on everybody towards custom strategies that consider your values and your individual risk factors and encouraging healthy behaviors like moving more, healthy eating, helping people think better, and being opportunistic about making positive change. So is your new family doc okay? I would say so. By less testing, she or, or he is likely improving your health and applying science not only to treatment, but to prevention. Like a lot of things in life, when we think about it, more isn't always better. Better communication and, and knowing yourself allow you to choose a little more wisely. Hope this helps.